So I'm really pleased to introduce um, John Fora, who is at the GW School of Business. Um, he's Associate Director for the Institute for Corp Corporate Responsibility, Associate Research Professor, Strategic Management uh, and Public Policy, and Associate Faculty for uh, Tractinum School of Public Policy and Public Administration. Thank you. This is the last one, right? So this is um, international cri uh, food crisis and international aid, but uh, Michael and I talked about it. And what we thought we'd do is talk a little bit about, of course, in the context of global food crisis, so I say tackling them, but I'm going to talk a bit about how we might tackle them in the spirit of collaboration, a little different way than we may have done in the past. And then Michael has, of course, his experiences with one, which is great, and he's going to talk about that. So four things to talk about, right? How general references that our policy grasp exceeds our governance reach, right? That there's a lot of things we want to do, and frankly, I'd argue we really just don't know how to do them very well. How we need to take a new approach if we're going to solve them, how it means engaging business, and then a little bit about being a governance entrepreneur. So, of course, we're all connected globally. You all know this. This is a mapping of the number of business-to-business -business contacts. I thought it was just a nice little illustration, and you can see where some of the main points and nodes are, but it's really just to make this notion of being globalized, being networked, being interconnected, being interdependent, and that world is driving a lot of the conditions that we find today, and if we have some food crises and food problems, it's all in the context of this newly globalized world. But it's, luckily, it's the same factors of globalization which give us some opportunity and some promise and chance of actually coming up with solutions to some of these problems that are so long-standing. Really a chance for you all to come up with solutions to some of these problems. So maybe you've heard this expression, right? When you have a hammer, every problem is a nail. So what I'm arguing is that the people who now are in power and the people who have influence, right, 40s, 50s, even 60s, they kind of grew up in a non-globalized world. And so the way they look at problems, the way they frame it, what they think works, what they think is smart, it just really doesn't fit so well anymore. We need to come up with new solutions, with new approaches to solutions. We need to come up with new ways of thinking about what the problem is in the first place. And if we can do that, then we have a chance to solve some of the most pressing major problems that we have, those directed with food. So I'm going to talk about one. So this is my favorite addiction, coffee, right? And fits many other commodities in the world. So I know that's a lot on the slide, but as you can see, the coffee story is one in which basically the farmers and the producers of the coffee don't do very well. They're not paid very much, right? They have a disadvantage when it comes to negotiating with the big purchasers. It has environmental consequences. If you're trying to grow more coffee, then you don't grow it under the sun and in shade as it used to be. Then you clear the trees and you grow it a different way. It has negative environmental um, impacts. The price, as I said, is not very good. Volatility in the market means that you never know what the prices you're going to get. That makes it hard to invest. It's, it's a bad situation, as in many commodities, of a negative impact on the communities where these commodities are grown, and they get in a development rut. Okay? But let's just look at this a little bit more. If we're going to solve the problem, it's easy to say, well, why don't we have the companies not uh, damage the environment? Or why don't we have people pay the farmers more money? Right? But it's all part of a little more complex arrangement than that. right? You see, we have low development levels because you've got a product that has, we say, low differentiation. It's a commodity. One is as good as the other. So if you try to sell your product at a price, the person next door has the exact same product. And so they can drive down the price. There's no way to really differentiate. So there's no way to try to capture some value from what you're doing. It's a push to the bottom, some basic economics. So they said, so you don't have good bargaining power. And if you don't have good bargaining power, then how is anyone going to come and invest and give you money or give you training or give you support in order to raise up and make your business better, to expand? You don't have any ability to do it. And because you don't have that, then you don't get much infrastructure development, and we go right back through the cycle all over again. So one of the stories about coffee is the story about commodities, where you've got this cycle. right? Low differentiation of the product means you can't really get much of a price 
which means people can't really invest in you, which means you can't really develop, which means you have commodities, which means low different, right? You can see the cycle. So how do you break that cycle? And just coming along and saying, well, as I said before, you really should be more thoughtful about the environment. You really should be more thoughtful about how much you pay people. It's not just isolated, it's all tied in together. So what I'm suggesting is that with these commodities and others, maybe we need a concept, a vision about how things could be better. So my vision is responsible coffee, right? And if you're gonna have responsible coffee, meaning you're gonna make coffee in a way which meets the social considerations that we want. People treated well, the community treated well, the environment treated well, really acting as a good corporate citizen, then you need to bring all these players together. You've got consumers, technical experts, retailers, direct purchasers, certifiers, the financers, the farmers, and as you might imagine, or some of you may know, people are working on these problems, right? So here you've got trying to find finance to get to farmers and technical expertise to help them. There's programs, there's organizations that try to do that. Or another one is linking certifiers to the farmers and the consumers, right? Trying to certify a certain kind of coffee, label it as a certain kind, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, and then see if people can use their purchasing power in order to make things better. And then you've got consumers and the companies going together. But what I'm arguing is that you need to see this as all part of a broader system. Too often we look isolated at one area or another area and we don't consider how it affects the other, right? And some of you might be saying, well, wait a minute, what about the certifiers? Aren't there all sorts of certification programs for trying to find responsible coffee, right? These are some of them, if you've heard of them, right? Rainforest Alliance, OOTS is very big in Europe, fair trade, bird friendly. All groups setting standards so that people can buy the coffee which is responsible. Can anyone think, is there any problem in this? Why doesn't this just solve the problem? Why isn't having certifiers the solution? Can anyone think of a reason why that may not work? What's one of the weaknesses that may be behind if you've heard of fair trade coffee? Yeah? Who is regulating these certifications? Yeah, who is regulating them? Who sets the standards, right? Who reviewed those standards? Who got brought on board or didn't? Who's part of it or who's not part of it? Definitely one of the issues in thinking about a collaborative approach as opposed to a more isolated approach. Can anyone think of another reason? A little hard with lights. Over there. Uh, people might not know the differences between the different certifications. Absolutely, right? And there's all this work, and I can tell you, all this literature. If you want to write an article studying the different brands and the labels and the colors and how people look at them and what they know and what they don't know, but it's very hard for them to differentiate. Maybe one more. Did you have a hand up? They said the uh, higher cost of specialized foods perceived higher cost of the whole food market. Right. People don't want to pay, or they don't know whether they're paying for, or they don't understand what the certificate. I mean, maybe many of you have heard of certified, right? And you understand that if you go to a store, you could pay more. The consumer is just not on board with it, right? So looking at certification is one approach, but it's just not fit into a broader system. And that's where people get frustrated. And that's what I'm arguing is that we need a more complete collaborative approach. So what I'm arguing is that if you're going to do it, they all need to be wrapped in together. And what I want to argue is that we've taken too much of a supply push approach and not enough of a demand pull approach. By supply push, I mean we've spent too much time on saying if we upgrade the farming, that will help, right? if we show ways of farming that will reduce the environmental consequences. Then we can make a product that people want, and then we can sell that product and things will work out well. Well, that just has not been gaining much traction. It's not that it doesn't work, it just doesn't have a very big impact. Maybe if we started on the other side of the equation and gave that some more attention, what is it, and I should say a lot of times people start with the individual consumer, what do people want? But a lot of times people don't know, or they don't know what they're buying. What about what can you sell? What can you get some major retailer, like a Costco, or a Walmart, or a McDonald's, or a 7-Eleven, what kind of coffee do they think people will buy? And then what do they think they can be successful selling? If you start there and ask that question, then you can start to go to the supply side and say, well, what can you make? And you blend them together, right? 
So there's plenty of organizations that are out there working on this model, not just looking at one side, right? Not just being an NGO, complaining about the way things are done, and then wanting legislation passed. Or not just a business who does it the way that they want to and just tries to block or manage or wash whatever the complaints are, right? These are just three examples of groups I've done case studies on, so I put them up there. You may want to look them up and look at them. They're pretty good examples of organizations that not only have done a collaborative approach, but they've brought in business into the mix. Brought them in up front and tried to say, what can we do? What's possible? What's the cost? What's the alternative? What might work better? How do we do this if they all have kind of a shared, shared idea? Right. Now, many of you hearing that might think, well, that's crazy. Because if you bring business in and ask them what they want, they might say, well, they just want to make a profit. right? They just want to make as much money as possible. But that's kind of the old thinking about many businesses. Of course, many do. Not all businesses are progressive. But many businesses recognize that they can't sustain their practice, their global practice, by just being isolated and solve all the problems themselves. So we have this kind of love-hate idea with business, right? We love them because they invest, because they create jobs, because they're innovative. On the other hand, we hate them because all they want is a profit, they don't pay people much money, they're exploitive, they destroy the environment. But I would suggest that unless we learn how to engage business in a constructive way, and it's not easy, but unless we learn, we're really not going to get very far. Or we're not going to get very far very quickly. It's going to be slow, plodding, bit by bit, just as we are right now. And here's the reason why I think, I hope you don't mind the pun, right? grounds for engaging business, is because businesses have problems too, right? We tend to think about them as being all powerful, taking care of everything. Every day they've got problems and threats to what it is they're trying to do. And if you're global, it's really a threat, right? I mean, what about your sourcing security? Meaning, where are you going to get your supply from? Where are you going to get your coffee beans from? Every day, at a certain amount, at a certain quality, because if you don't get those beans and you can't make the coffee and then when people go into Starbucks, they run out of coffee. How are you going to secure that for the long term, knowing you can do it for five years, 10 years down the road? That means you need to make sure that the areas where you're going or new areas are opening up. Or the risk mitigation associated with price volatility or uncertainty about conflict in some of the areas where you're growing coffee. And on and on. These are many of the issues that businesses worry about and if we start with the idea that business has problems, OK, we have an issue that we're trying to solve. I wonder if we put the two together, we might be able to come up with some kind of a solution that is better than the one we have now. right? So maybe by paying wages that's a little more, excuse me, that's a little higher than we have before, that would keep the farmers there a little more consistent, a little more long term. Maybe for business to support a little more investment in the farms means that they're going to be more productive and they'll be more stable. So we're not doing it to be nice. We're doing it because there's a good business reason. But a good business reason also benefits the people and the community and the environment. And it's the creative thinking that you need in order to put those two together. And we just don't do it too much. We always have this division between people who think business is fine and people who think business is bad. And people who want to say most of what business is good and people who want to attack them. And that just seems old school to me. The way in which you're going to have to solve problems is by engaging them and understanding them and then helping to solve problems. So for my last point, what I wanted to talk to you about was being what I'm calling a governance entrepreneur then. You're the ones who are going to have an opportunity for thinking new, innovative ways about how to bring these groups together. right? But it takes a certain approach and a certain point. So these are, you need this vision to start with. But it's got to be an informed one. You've got to look over the area, like with coffee, and think, is it possible to improve the way in which we grow coffee and harvest it so that the communities where people live can make somewhat of a decent living, so that the environment isn't as damaged as much, so there's more control and stability in the world, and so it works more smoothly? Can we do that in a way that benefits the community and that benefits business? You have to start going back and forth, getting your idea of what's too much, what's too little, what's possible. That means you really need to understand. 
And that's the second one. You need to have creative problem solving and from many perspectives. If you look at it just from the point of view of political science or public policy, or if you look at it just through business or just through economics or just through sociology, you just won't get there. You need to really try to understand what is business about? What are they trying to accomplish? How do they think? What motivates them? Same way. What can I do with NGOs? And what are they about? What are they interested in doing? What about the local community? I mean, it's hard. That's why a lot of people haven't done it so much. Because one, they're not trained in order to take these different perspectives. They're typically trained to take one perspective and be really good at it, and then you hold your point of view, right? And then you don't let go, and then we kind of push back and forth. But in a collaborative approach, you need to take multiple perspectives, understand the other person's point of view, so then you can be creative and help solve problems. Well, I've got labeled jars and not people, meaning empathy is what you need to have, right? Almost be sympathetic to business in the case. Here they are trying to grow a certain crop, in this case coffee or others. They're trying to process it, bring it to market at a certain quality and present it to you at a price that's competitive. That's hard to do. So what problems do they have that come with it? Maybe if you're sympathetic to them and a little empathetic of saying, I understand why that is an issue through your supply chain. Understand why having some disruption all of a sudden makes you shift your sourcing supply from one country to another, and that makes it difficult. So what can we do to help solve that problem? Now, that's not usually how NGOs think. It's usually not how the government thinks. But that's what you guys are. And the same thing for business. How could business do things that can help NGOs or help government policy and advance it? But you have to be empathetic. You can't be attacking. <clears throat> you can't be thinking, I'm right and you're wrong. You have to be thinking, let me just listen and see if I can learn something and going back to the top. And then we can come up with a creative solution. Right? You want to facilitate solutions inside and out. I only put that up there to say it's not just for the people who are dealing with it. It's also back inside the organization. If you're a business person, you work for the Office of Sustainability, and you're involved in negotiating, whatever you come up with, you have to take that idea and go tell your boss. Right? If you're running a program in the government, you have to go back and explain it to them. If you're an NGO, so you also then have to push and say, now I'm not just coming up with a good solution, but I'm coming up with a good solution for you in your job. You, as one of the members in the collaboration team, you want to go back and say, I've got this possible deal. It's a good deal for the group, but it's a good deal for the company, or it's a good deal for our organization, or it's a good deal for public policy. And let me tell you why. So then the whole group starts to solve everybody's problems. And then they start sharing information. And yes, it takes a little trust, and it takes a little work. Again, that's why there's not so many of these groups out there being successful. That's what I'm talking about, our innovative win-win-win solutions. And the last thing, eyes on the prize, is just to keep focused on what is the thing you're trying to accomplish. A lot of times when we have these collaborations and the models out there, people talk about aligning goals. I want the goals to be the same. I've researched these things. I don't think it works. People have different goals. People have different motivations. Why do we care? If the goal is to help 1,000 farmers create more productive farms with less environmental damage right, and greater return to the farmer, but more stability for the business, then that's what we're all working on, 1,000 farmers. And if we can agree up front, then everyone can understand how they might contribute, what their exposure is, what the risk is, what it takes to do it. They start thinking, well, Maybe we should do it a different way. And if 1,000 is not enough, then make it 2,000. Make it 10,000. Make it five. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But unless you really focus first on what it is, these partnerships start to unravel. Because everyone has their own ideas. Everyone has their own motivations. Everyone has their own worlds to live in. So if you can focus on that last one, eyes on the prize, then these models end up being successful. Okay. So the only last thing I wanted to say was a little shameless advertisement, which is if you're interested in this area on Friday, you can see and check. You can go to the ICR webpage. Right? We're having an interactive webcast on this, bringing in people from chocolate producers, in this case, from Rainforest Alliance, from others, just to start again a conversation, this one on chocolate, how can we start to make responsible chocolate? Right? It would be nice to have chocolate bars or chocolate in the restaurants that you're buying knowing that it was produced in a 
good way, right? That it didn't have negative consequences, that they weren't using slave labor, that the environmental wasn't damaged, and you know, of course you want to eat it if you could. So the discussion is how do we do that? How do we bring that to market knowing that there's different kinds of constraints? Okay. All right, so that's all I'm going to talk about in terms of kind of the model, and I'm going to let Michael come up, right, and talk about some specific examples that he's done, right, with his organization one, right? Thank you. Oh, I think you're using the same clicker. Am I using this? Ah! <laughs> I mean, I, I have a very good excuse. I know for a professor it shouldn't be excuses, but they have a great one. Uh, hola. Well, how are you, Jan? How are you? Today is Earth Day, so I was enjoying Earth. <laughs> Do you know today was Earth Day? Who, everybody knew? Yeah. It's an important day, it's our day. I'm, uh, no, yeah, don't yeah, sit yeah. down, you're yeah, about okay, to speak. Okay, right, okay, I'm okay, here okay. to listen to you. <laughs> Sorry, Miss. But you and I will go through it. Okay. So anyway, today, food, international crisis, food aid, President Obama. Absolutely. Under the gun, because use presented um, his budget and many things, and everyone will complain. But one of them is the international aid. Yep. The money that USA gives away to help the world. And he's reducing that amount of money, I think from 1.4 mm -hmm. billion mm -hmm. yeah. to I don't know what. And it's a lot of people very unhappy. But it's actually a lot of people very happy. The unhappy ones are precisely organizations, companies, the shipping uh, companies of America, some of the big agribusiness, because by cutting that amount of money, obviously, somebody's going to be making less. What President Obama is proposing is that money, instead of be buying American food and be shipped and export overseas, why we don't get that money and buy from the farmers in Haiti, in Kenya, or anywhere that USA wants to do good. This is food for thought. What's the right thing to do? To help first without taking care of buying from farmers or helping the shipping industry? Or more important, really, to help the people that on paper we want to help? This is food for thought. This is one of the most amazing things that we're going to be finding. We want to help, but in the process, we are spending more than 50% of the food aid in shipping. So what's smarter? Really to help the people we are meant to help or not to? This is one of the most fascinating topics probably on food aid, and hopefully you're going to be touching some of that. So welcome. Anyone wants to know more about him? You go and you read his curriculum. <laughs> but if I tell you that Time Magazine is behind it at the top, this is impressive enough. We are lucky that a guy like him use running the one campaign and really having a big input in the world in making sure that governments, people, one person at a time knows that by the right decisions, we can really be feeding the world in a better way. And I thank you for it. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> so now I have to, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Jose, for having us, uh, or Chef Andres, I should say. Pro Jose. Professor, Professor Andres, Jose. Yeah, right. Uh, it's, uh, it's, great to be, uh, it's great to be back at GW. My elder daughter is, uh, is an alum, so it has a uh, class of 2010, so it has a very special place in my heart. I think she did most of her research on food and drink policy in McFadden's, but, you know, that's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, now that she's three years out, she says, oh, McFadden's, oh, God, you know, I mean, I wouldn't go there, you know, I mean. <laughs> Now it's all hanging out of 14th and U and 8th Street and all those kind of cool places. Uh, but back then, believe me, you know, I had a lot about McFadden's. This stage it has a very, very, very special place in my heart because our World AIDS Day 2011, 18 months ago, I wonder if any of you were here for that. Any of you? Were you actually here in the room? Any of you here? So we had what we called the morning of four presidents. 
uh, when President Obama gave a speech uh, from this very stage on World AIDS Day about uh, the administration's initiatives on tackling HIV AIDS internationally. It was an event that we at the One Campaign put together. So we had on the stage Bono, Alicia Keys, Marco Rubio, Muta Kent, the CEO of, uh, of Coca-Cola, President Obama. Oy. Uh, we had uh, on video from Africa, President Bush, uh, and pr with President Kikwete from Tanzania doing a, a video link up to GW. And we had from Florida, because the big dog always finds his way in, you know, we had President Clinton uh, coming in from Florida talking about it as well. So we had this incredible morning uh, on this very stage. So it's, uh, it's great to be back at GW because it's part of my family, and believe me, uh, I have the check stubs to prove it. Uh, you all know about that, right? You all, you, all, uh, you all read that piece in the Washington Post last week, I know. <laughs> and, um, uh, and it's particularly pleasing to be here uh, because this, uh, this room has a kind of very, very special place in my heart. It's fantastic to be here as a guest of, uh, of Jose, uh, whose restaurants uh, I first ate in. This is the third time in my life I've lived in Washington, D.C. When did Cafe Atlantico start on, on, uh, on 18th Street? 20 years ago? 21 years ago? 20 on 18, no, uh, 24 years ago. 24 years ago. I, I was not there then. Right. Well, you came that was, what was very good. Right. Before I was. <laughs> but, uh, and I remember Haleo opening, which must be 20 years ago. 20 years. Now. Right. Uh, so I've been, uh, I've been eating uh, Jose food for a long time and enjoying it. And... Um, it's great to be here. So let me, let me tell you, let me pick up uh, a few of John's points on food policy, nutrition. I want to say something about uh, what Jose said about food aid just uh, uh, a little while ago and, uh, and give you a perspective from where I sit as the president and CEO of the One Campaign. So as, as many of you, I'm sure, know, uh, One is a grassroots advocacy and campaigning organization dedicated to eliminating, uh, eliminating, extreme poverty and preventable disease, particularly in Africa. We concentrate on Africa as our main focus because Africa is the hardest nut to crack in terms of improving people's life chances, in terms of eradicating poverty, in terms of tackling preventable disease. So if you get interventions right in Africa, by and large, you're going to kind of get them right uh, everywhere. So we, we tend to concentrate uh, our work largely but not exclusively in Africa. Um, one, as you probably know, was co-founded by Bono and others. It's actually a conglomeration of three or four organized, three organizations that have kind of come together over the last 10 years. Uh, so we have a kind of variety of operations that we, that we do that I might go into, uh, into later on. We're headquartered just a few blocks away from here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have offices in New York where we run our Product Red campaign, which is consumer, consumerism with a cause, if you like. Uh, we have offices in London, New York, uh, Brussels, uh, Berlin, Paris, and Johannesburg. We're backed by more than 3 million members around the world, and we seek policy change through advocacy and campaigning. We do this by raising public awareness and pressing political leaders of all stripes to support effective programs that deliver real results in terms of lives saved, lives improved, people reduced, uh, people, people removed from hunger, people uh, removed from the scourge of malnutrition uh, and preventable disease and the grinding horror of extreme poverty. We're a nonpartisan organization. We don't make grants. We always say we're not interested in your money. We're interested in your voice. Uh, we bring voices together of people around the world. We work very, very closely with African leaders, with entrepreneurs and activists in the continent itself to, su to support sustainable development and growth by Africans and for Africans. And as many, of you, uh, uh, as many of you I'm sure know, change is happening at an incredibly fast rate in Africa uh, as uh, you have increased economic growth, you have increased democracy, uh, more and more governments democratically elected and democratically accountable, something that we consider essential to development, incidentally, uh, and the sense of a, uh, of a continent on the move. Now, alleviating extreme poverty is hardly a small thing. In fact, it can be, it can be positively overwhelming when you contemplate the magnitude of the challenge and the obstacles there are to meeting it. But there are, there are several key elements of what we do 
uh, or one, and several kind of key topics on which we concentrate, food security, tackling hunger, improving agricultural productivity, form a very, very kind of key node uh, in our operations, and that, of course, is what I'm here to talk to you today. So uh, I think um, we might have sent this around uh, later on, but uh, here's a short video clip that sort of articulates our approach. We did a number of PSAs and videos around the time of the Horn of Africa uh, famine in 2011, uh, and this, whoops, hang on, and this was one of them. There it is. So as you can see, famine, hunger, malnutrition, food insecurity are major impediments to development. Food is one of our most basic needs, and without it, an individual or a family can't begin to contemplate the next steps that really lead to a better life, education, economic development, what have you. There's an undeniable connection between agriculture and the elimination of poverty, according to the World Bank. Growth in the agriculture sector is two and a half times as effective as reducing poverty as growth in any other sector. These aren't localized issues. The causes of food insecurity, whether it's climate change, war, what have you, extend beyond borders, and solutions require a concerted effort from all of us, from international donors, from national governments, civil society, farmers, investors, entrepreneurs, agribusiness, many more. We at One always believe that the solutions to questions of food insecurity, to hunger, malnutrition, should be both proactive and they should be led by countries themselves. Proactive in the sense that we know there will always be geographic areas like the Sahel in Africa that are particularly vulnerable to drought or other environmental factors that can trigger food emergencies. So rather than react with emergency food aid, and I'll get on to food aid in a second, one argues that agriculture and development policy that recognizes and mitigates those vulnerabilities is what's really important. But even controlling for those vulnerabilities, Sub-Saharan Africa has the right conditions, farmland that hasn't yet been developed, water and climate, to feed not only itself, but to become a major food supplier for the rest of the world. I did a program about a year ago at a conference in which I was interviewing on stage the CEO of Cargill, which is one of the world's kind of largest agribusiness uh, companies, uh, a huge shipper, of palm oil, of wheat, of soy, and other things. And I, I said to the CEO, so, you know, uh, you've done amazing things in the last 25 years in the food industry. We've learned how to feed a world of six or seven billion people. Can we feed a world of nine billion people? And I'd hardly finished the question before he said, not without Africa, we can't. Not without Africa, he can't. By some measures, these, these measures are always kind of slightly controversial, something like 60% of the undeveloped, water-fed land in the world is in Africa. And if we can increase productivity of the agricultural sector in Africa, we'll not only help Africa to feed itself, 
uh, we'll help it. Uh, we'll help it feed the the uh, the world. So our advocacy model works like this. Our first step is building awareness. It's an uphill battle to get the attention of the media, the public, policymakers on issues outside their own backyard. And we tackle that with a two-pronged strategy. Visible public campaigns to build grassroots support and high-level policy engagement on Cong in Congress, on the Hill, in the administration, in London, in Brussels, in Berlin, Paris, and lots of other places to kind of really push uh, our issues. And we particularly concentrate on key mo moments We've got a G8 coming in, uh, in uh, the UK uh, in six weeks' time, so that'll be a kind of major focus of our effort, and I'll talk about that in, uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, and we're blessed by having uh, a co-founder, Bono, who is um, the world's greatest campaigner on this sort of stuff, uh, who has forged uh, incredibly deep and close relationships with policymakers and countries around the world who has 25 years of expertise at talking about issues of extreme poverty, preventable disease, hunger, and nutrition, uh, and who has the ability to call on his friends every so often uh, to help. So again, at the time of the uh, Horn of Africa famine, uh, a couple of years ago, we, did a, uh, we put together a little video that we called Famine is the Real Obscenity. So have a look at this. Famine is the real obscenity. Famine. 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 30,000 children have died in just three months. 30,000 children. In just three months. The worst drought in 60 this years. This is devastating parts, parts of Africa. And 12 million men, women, and children are on the brink. In 2011. Really? Are you kidding me? Now we know how to stop We know how to stop this. We know how to stop, stop this. Early warning systems. Food reserves. Better seeds. And irrigation. More peace and security. Drought is an act of nature. Famine, Famine is man-made. Man Famine. Famine is man-made. Famine is man-made. Go to one.org. Let's put a end to famine. Well, come on! Give it up to, for Governor Huckabee. You know, I mean, Ooh. conservative Republican. Uh, ending, our, uh, ending our little PSA with, uh, with an F-bomb. I thought it was pretty good. I mean, admittedly, blacked out. And who knows whether he actually said that, really. But anyway, you know. Uh, so uh, we put together, we put together uh, high-profile um, uh, celebrities, A-listers, uh, to help us campaign. For us, actually, the key of that video is not Colin Farrell or Mike Huckabee or Mike Bloomberg, or George Clooney, or Idris Elba, or all the other people who are on it. The key is go to one.org right at the end, because that drives people from being passive viewers to being proactive action takers. We direct members to petitions or other tools to express their opinions to policymakers, sending a clear signal that constituents are aware and invested in these issues. I mean, I can go to Capitol Hill and talk to a congressman or, a, or a, to talk to a senator or a member of Congress until I'm blue in the face. But what really counts for them is when they know that their constituents back in their districts really care about an issue. It's when they kind of go back and do a, a, uh, an event at a diner and see kind of lots of people in one t-shirts who are talking to them about hunger, about malnutrition, about poverty. Uh, that's when they... Uh, that's when they really, um, <clears throat> that's when they really listen. We don't just do our campaigning in the rich world, in places like the UK and the US. Uh, more and more, we're taking our campaign and our model to Africa itself. <clears throat> Last year, we enrolled our first continent-wide petition. First time we delivered a petition on African soil, uh, asking African leaders to invest in agriculture and nutrition to lift 31 million people out of poverty and prevent 12 million people from suffering from stunting, which is what happens when you don't have nutritious food in the first thousand days from conception to two. So we worked with NGOs in Africa. We worked with African ambassadors, lots of citizens and more. We got 16,000 petition signers from across the continent. We went to the, uh, the State House in, uh, in Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania. President Kikwete of Tanzania was sort of enormously uh, encouraging of our effort, and he pledged to meet the commitment that all African governments have made to dedicate 10% of their budgets 
uh, to agriculture and, uh, and so put in place the infrastructure and quality measures that will really lead to a reduction in, uh, in hunger. Second part of our, uh, of our advocacy uh, program is to concentrate on, on really, really smart policy. And the, one of the ways in which we, uh, one of the ways that we think is, is absolutely crucial here is to support country-led plans, plans that have really been put together in, uh, in countries themselves. Um, in 2003, African heads of state and government, as I say, committed 10% of their budgets uh, to agriculture, so we kind of try and keep on those African governments to keep their promises. And we also press our international donors, the US, the UK, the EU, Germany, France, Japan, what have you, to make smart commitments. I think you had a, uh, a class uh, in this program from Jonathan Schreier, uh, the State Department's Special Representative on Global Food Security a few weeks ago. He talked about the, the L'Aquila Initiative of 2009, which resulted in $22 billion in pledges to support sustainable agriculture and food security. Nearly as important as the dollar figure was the agreement on a set of principles to deliver effective strategic assistance, including commitments to invest in country-led plans and provide long-term financing. But real progress, as John said earlier, requires more than national governments and donors. And it was great that, uh, that in John's uh, earlier comments, he dwelt so much on the private sector, because we recognize that the one campaign that you won't solve issues of, uh, of poverty, food security, without engaging uh, the private sector. Last year, I saw the launch of what's called the New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition at the 2012 G8 summit here in the US. Uh, and that was a true case study of how one and, uh, and all of us uh, worked. Uh, we had 3,000 members signing petitions. Uh, we, uh, we had inside lobbying. We had a lot of people here. Bono was here for the G8, gave a major speech uh, at um, a, uh, where was that speech? That was a GW2, I think. Anyway, uh, um, so we did lots and lots of stuff to, uh, to put together a program to lift uh, 50 million people out of poverty through agricultural uh, investment. So this sort of gives us a, a sense of the various things that we try and do to, uh, to get to the commitment of leading, uh, of, of taking 50 million people out of poverty by investment in agriculture, 9,000 postcards sent to President Obama, uh, 12,000 stars doing YouTube videos. We did a funny or die video, which is very funny, ha ha ha. Um, <coughs> that Zach Galef Galifiniakis, <laughs> you, know, you know the guy, beard, you know. Uh, <coughs> uh, we did eight signature events on World Food Day. We had 300,000 petition signers uh, with Oxfam. And Jose, you did something for Oxfam, I remember. We got celebrity chefs doing all sorts of stuff. We made the sweet potato a, uh, a um, worldwide symbol of, uh, of nutrition in uh, investment. 100 of our members submitted recipes onto our website. Uh, we had 10,000 World Food Day tweets. Um, we did a street tweeter. I'll explain what that is later on. We did a big report, and we had 150 million media impressions. So that's sort of the, the kind of holistic campaigning uh, that we engage in uh, to kind of really move things forward. But what's every bit as important uh, is not just doing campaigning, not just raising awareness, not just doing campaigning, but tracking progress. It's key to our advocacy model to hold people to account for what they promise. <clears throat> so we track both country and donor commitments. We do an, agri an, an annual agriculture accountability. My god, that's difficult to say. We do an annual agriculture accountability report uh, that tracks what donors are doing to, uh, to meet their L'Aquila commitments. And as you can see, we've seen a 50% shortfall uh, in funding uh, country-led plans. And then we also track uh, the commitments that African uh, countries themselves have made. Again, big gaps, 4.4 billion in, uh, in 2011. <clears throat> so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of money uh, at stake, and there's a lot of gaps in what we believe is needed to gather 50 million people uh, out of poverty. Let, let's have a kind of a little closer look at the new alliance for food and, food and nutrition security, which was, uh, which was 
um, launched last year. So here's how the model is supposed to work. Host governments make policy reforms to open up the business environment. Tanzania, for example, is getting rid of excess taxes, creates land, new land tenure systems and what have you. Then companies make commitments. Companies from the developed world make commitments to invest uh, in, the, uh, in uh, the developing world, to act, invest in various activities along the value chain. New technology, new seeds, training, storage facilities, incredibly important. 1.4 billion people around the world, 880 million of them in sub-Saharan Africa have no access to electricity on any sort of basis at all. So if people can come in and invest in cold storage so that, uh, and, other, uh, and other forms of, uh, of ensuring that food actually leaves the fields and gets to markets without, uh, without spoiling, that's a kind of massive investment. And finally, smallholder farmers come in themselves make their own investments and benefit directly and indirectly in, uh, in an improvement. So you get a virtual cycle, you get more food grown, you get economic growth, and you get uh, a reduction uh, in poverty. None of this is, is guaranteed. All of it is, uh, all of it is, um, uh, is contingent on continued work <coughs> by, uh, by policymakers in the rich world and the poor world, by NGOs maintaining pressure, by private uh, government, by private corporations investing. Uh, and so you have to kind of have a, a, a movement on all fronts uh, before you get something. <clears throat> so two things are happening right now uh, that exemplify how you have to kind of move on all fronts. One of them, Jose alluded to right at the beginning, which is that the US is, is trying the, the administration is trying to change its food aid system. Uh, hitherto, uh, the, the dominant, not the only, but the dominant uh, method of US food aid has essentially been to ship surplus food from the US to the developing world where it's distributed as emergency food aid, which is an act of tremendous generosity on behalf of, of American farmers, taxpayers, and, one, and, uh, and what have you. Uh, but most people who've looked at that system uh, would argue that one of the things that it does is distort the agricultural incentives in countries themselves. Uh, what it, uh, obviously, what it doesn't do uh, is provide an incentive for local farmers, uh, for local cooperatives, ag local companies to invest in their own production and, uh, and feed their own people. So the US has a, a highly controversial, among, particularly among shippers, as Jose said, uh, proposal at the moment to shift an enormous amount of its food aid from food to money, essentially, so that, the, so that instead of kind of shipping soy or wheat or whatever it is from the US, that is turned into cash that goes into developing world markets and, uh, and is spent uh, to, uh, to encourage farmers uh, to grow more food, have better su supplies, uh, have better storage the facilities so that they are more resilient at times of, uh, of, uh, of crisis. So that's one of the things that we're keeping an eye on. Second thing that we're keeping an eye on right now is the June G8 summit, uh, which is taking place uh, in, the, uh, in the UK. Uh, it's actually a series of meetings over about 10 days uh, in the UK in June, about six weeks' time. We'll be pushing governments to deliver on past promises made at past G8 summits and, <clears throat> and at the same time to show that they're backing African governments' own agriculture and nutrition plans with the resources uh, needed. It's a historic moment to garner financial and other commitments to make real progress against malnutrition, particularly the scourge of, of stunting. Stunting, as I say, is what happens when kids don't get the essential nutrients that they need in, the, in that crucial thousand days from conception uh, until they're a little, uh, a little over two years old. Uh, it's an astonishing um, uh, burden that children carry for their whole life if they don't get those essential nutrients. Uh, their cognitive abilities are significantly less developed. They're literally smaller uh, in every possible way. Uh, so one of the main uh, focuses uh, of our attention uh, over the next year at the G8 summit and beyond is to make sure that there's a real global push 
on nutrition. Nutrition was sort of left on the table a little at the G8 summit in the US last year, so we really want to kind of concentrate on it for this year. And as John said, uh, that takes a, a push by a variety of actors. It takes a push by the private sector, by companies, uh, by scientists, by food scientists, uh, by pe people figuring out how you can get mic micronutrients into, into crops like cassava and sweet potato uh, that are particularly uh, used in the developing world. Uh, it would require NGOs, civil society organizations to keep lobbying governments and it will require governments to increase their amount of support uh, for programs that, uh, that really look at nutrition. So looking forward, those are two big things that we'll be, uh, that we'll be looking at over, uh, over the next few months or so, ensuring that the, that the, insofar as we can, working with our partners to make sure that the useful proposals by the US administration on food aid go through and making sure that uh, at the G8 summit in London, uh, there is a significant push to improve nutrition policy around the world and to kind of provide the resources before it. So that's what we do. We've got a big agenda uh, this summer. So come join us, join the fight against extreme poverty. Action Speak Louder is what we like to say. You can all go to one.org and sign on. And uh, great to be here. John and I will happily take questions, I guess, right? Is that what we do next? Thank you. Hopefully, we ask the right question, we'll get the right answers. <laughs> thank you. Um, first, thank you both for speaking. That was great. Um, the two videos that you showed uh, from the one campaign, I know there's a lot of talk right now about poverty porn. About and, poverty porn. And so this idea that we're using poverty kind of as this exploitative idea, um, you know, on places, and how much does one kind of feed into that? What is your response to that? Um, kind of using these these images and this visualization to kind of get your ideas across, and, and how much um, goes into that thinking when you when you develop these uh, films. Those, those films were, uh, were addressing a very, very specific crisis, which is the worst famine for 25, <clears throat> 30 years in the Horn of Africa. So that was a, that was a particular uh, crisis that, uh, that needed to be addressed and needed to be addressed in an uh, urgent and generous way. Uh, at, the, at the one campaign, our um, whole raison d'etre is to be exceptionally positive. Uh, about the uh, the potential uh, of Africa, where uh, where a we're about Africa rising, we're not about Africa in crisis. Um, some of you have probably seen a speech that Bono gave uh, at the TED conference just last month. Have, have any of you yeah, any of you seen Bono's Bono's TED talk? It's got it's kind of gone viral, had uh, had hundreds of thousands of views. But he did a 13-minute speech at TED, which you can all just kind of go to the TED website and look at. Uh, which was about the extraordinary progress uh, that Africa has made, in, uh, particularly in the last 10 years, and particularly in global health issues. Uh, so we're about progress. We're not about, we're not about um, uh, doing uh, images of, uh, of um, misery. Uh, I, I, I don't th actually think many people do that any, anymore. Uh, but uh, when a real crisis uh, presents itself in the way that the Horn of Africa famine did two years ago, uh, it's appropriate to address it and remind people that people are, are dying, you know, are dying every day uh, and dying needlessly. So poverty porn, that's the first time I listened to that term. Very interesting. I've been listening to food, but no, poverty, that's great. More questions? Anything, anything you want to add? No, Anytime no. You speak up. More questions. Hi, um, my question is, in both of those videos, um, there are short references to better seeds. And I was wondering if that was a reference to GMOs and um, what one's opinion on GMOs are. It's before. not, actually. It's a reference to better seeds. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, if it was a reference to GMO, it would say GMO. It doesn't. It says better seeds. Uh, there is an enormous, uh, one of the, one of the uh, key uh, lessons 
uh, in, uh, in global agriculture at the moment is how much can be done just with, literally with better seeds, uh, with kind of relatively, relatively low tech uh, interventions in agriculture, uh, with better seed varieties, uh, with better irrigation systems, uh, with better transportation systems, uh, with better storage systems, uh, all of those are valuable interventions that, uh, uh, that can be made across the board uh, to massively uh, uh, increase agricultural productivity. So what's, the, what's your position precisely about that? On GMO? No, on GMO, but how are we going to be feeding those 9 billion people by the year 250? You, as one, you are uh, organization right. that mainly tries to influence yeah. the powers to be around the world, in the States, G8, England, in the powerful countries that, by their actions, can change the way we're going to be feeding the world. So you have to, be, you have, to have so I, kind of an opinion about what no, are you supporting? What's, so I, our, our theory of change would, uh, would um, encompass, I suppose, three elements. Uh, first of all, very much kind of picking up the, uh, the sort of lines that John was, uh, was talking about in his presentation, uh, that no one actor or set of actors uh, has the solution to these, to these problems. Um, in the case of food security and uh, eradicating hunger, increasing um, the extent to which kids get nutritious food in, uh, in their first years of life, uh, that's something that requires action by African governments themselves, by poor, uh, by, uh, by national governments themselves, to make sure that they have plans uh, to encourage uh, farmers uh, to farm better, extension programs, uh, uh, support with irrigation, uh, infrastructure programs that get, uh, that get produce to market. Uh, it involves uh, external assistance from donor countries like the US, the EU countries, and others uh, to make sure that their programs are actually aligned with what uh, local governments, with what national governments uh, are doing, rather than working against them. Uh, it involves uh, actions by entrepreneurs, small and large. Uh, every, every African farmer, every farmer anywhere in the world is an entrepreneur. Uh, so it involves encouragement of entrepreneurship uh, on behalf of small and large farmers, but it certainly also involves investment uh, from large uh, agribusiness companies uh, to, source their, uh, to source their products in, uh, in, uh, in new ways. So it involves, it involves action, and involves action by everyone. And, and the other thing that I would say is that it often involves thinking about the unexpected. I mentioned agriculture, uh, I, I mentioned electricity uh, deliberately in my remarks because everyone forgets about it. Every, it's, you know, people think about hunger, people think about uh, poverty, people think about diseases like HIV, AIDS, malaria, what have you. Uh, and very few of us think about what life is like uh, after 6.30 at night for 1.4 billion uh, people around the world. Uh, this, so this is a kind of exercise that I call life after dark. So at 6.30 at night, for 1.4 billion people around the world, life stops. I mean, all the things that we can do uh, after 6.30, homework, watching TV, surfing the web, what have you, 1.4 billion people, 880 million or so in sub-Saharan Africa can't. Uh, if you could provide power on a regular basis to the poor parts of the world, you would not just enable kids to do homework. You would not just make sure the clinics could keep vaccines cold and that uh, a maternity ward could, uh, uh, would have a better chance uh, of doing an operation to save uh, the life of someone who might otherwise die in childbirth. But you'd also transform, literally transform, the agricultural sector uh, because you would have the ability to store goods in, uh, in cold conditions uh, to move them from farm to storage facilities at the port or wherever or into a town. Uh, you could have electricity to do irrigation pumps, which you probably don't have now. Uh, and uh, in all possible ways, you'd, uh, you'd, uh, you'd improve productivity. So a lot of, a lot of what we do is, is, is kind of deliberately challenging people to think about 
the unexpected interventions that really, uh, that really spark change. Comments, questions? Wait, I, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to come back to the GMO question at first. And so I think this is part of the, the challenge, aside from how you feel about GMOs, right? It's how we label and start with what the problem is. So I suppose either we're for GMOs or we're against GMOs. But then someone has to define what a GMO is, and that's difficult if you've looked into it, right? Whether you're for it or against it, it's difficult to know what exactly that would be. So it seems if we're going to make progress, again, we have to kind of curtail a little bit on coming up with solutions and answers too quickly and spend a little more time trying to understand what's actually involved. Or if you use organic, that's probably even easier right, to talk about. A lot of people are just pro-organic. But if you're selling or if you're in a restaurant, can you actually buy enough, quote, organic food, end quote, in order to regularly provide to the customers what they want on the menu? And the answer may be no. So then, but does that make the restaurant bad for not selling organic food? So you'd almost say, well, what did you want with organic in the first place? Like, why did you pick organic as the thing that you want? Maybe you wanted food that was safer. Maybe you wanted food that didn't have pesticides. Well, what? level of pesticides? What's the trace element of pesticide that's OK? You know, it's just so much of the discussion starts with, I'm not blaming you. It's, the, it's exactly what we do, right? We start with some notion, and we try to make it the good or the bad, and then we kind of debate about whether we can get it or we can't get it. And for people who don't, then we tend to make them the bad guy. And if they're on our side, then we make them not. And I think if we're going to solve some of these solutions, we need to be a little more innovative problem solving and just start with what is it that we want? And maybe organic gets us that, but maybe something that's less than organic. I mean, it may not meet the USDA definition of organic, but you have to ask why do we want it in the first place? And that's only going to come then by having conversations with people who are involved in selling it, in purchasing and distributing it, in actually making it, and seeing and then if you can get that level. I mean, it just comes back to this model of collaboration where if we're going to break some of these terrible problems, if we just stick with our notions, and it's no one's fault because this is kind of how we're trained sometimes to think about it in classes or in schools, taught concepts, taught ideas, links to public policy, and then off we go. Right? And the model I'm suggesting is one which is almost, if you'd say it's almost anti-policy. right? Let's not worry about policy yet. Let's just figure out what we're talking about. And that's not easy when people are used to arguing or people are used to debating and coming up with their point and then trying to run it through. But I think if we're going to have success, it's going to be more about trying to understand what people want, what might be the impact of GMOs on certain communities or on certain crops, and can you preserve it? And we just don't spend enough time on that because we don't spend enough time talking to all the people who are involved in it and then coming up with some creative kind of solution. And if I just might, by comparison, I think it's the same thing of the question of how are we going to feed all the right billions of people who are not. We just don't make enough money now feeding those billions of people. right? We make too much money keeping it the way it is. So you can get mad at the people who benefit from such a system and say they're bad people and they shouldn't do it, but that's really not much of a way to change. But maybe you can start to think of some innovative ways that you can start to move some investment into communities who can start to make their own products. But maybe that displaces crops that are cash crops that are exported. So that's not going to make the exporters happy, which may not make the governments happy. Which is, so the change right, that you're advocating for, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to have conflict. So to me, the way in which you deal with the conflict is by bringing people together and saying, is there a way that we can do it so then everyone wins? right? Can we get some investment in a product which may displace something you're exporting, but maybe you can export a little bit more? Or maybe you can grow it internally, and then you don't have to import as more. But we live and operate so much in our silos that if you have one benefit in a place, growing some new crop, distributing it locally so you don't have to import, the people who are responsible for that, they don't get the budget benefit, right? They may lose money, someone else gains money, but you never bring them together like in the government budget. Right? One program saves money, but the other one can't capture. So it's just this approach to collaboration of thinking that unless we reach across many of the problems we're dealing with, we're just going to continue right, to perpetuate, unfortunately, at kind of this slow grind. And I would say there's enough urgency that for your generation and for your time, you're not really held back and constrained. 
living globally, seeing all the possibilities, instant access to information, learning anything you want, any time you want about all this stuff and people, it's all there. But you need that mindset of wanting to do something different, something innovative, something that will change, something that will create value for more people and really stirring it up. Not confrontational, but collaborative and building in a positive way. So. Very good point. Um, so you both kind of touched upon the private sector and social entrepreneurship. And I, uh, I just started a company and I'm seeking B Corp certification and wanted to know your opinion on uh, a couple days ago, Delaware passed legislation to pass uh, B Corp certification. And I wanted to know what kind of an impact you thought that would have. Do you want to go? <laughs> I, I didn't, I, sorry, I didn't. Oh, B, B Corps, B Corporations. Oh, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an you should, expert. You should look them up, pretty cool. Yep. <laughs> so, I will. So why do you want to be certified as a B Corporation? Uh, I mean, it gives you, it shows that you are trying to make social change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's appealing for not only consumers, but also investors and things along those lines. So yeah. can you explain to all of us what the B Corporation yeah. is all about? Sure. And makes different to any other it's, one? Um, it's, I have it right here, actually. <laughs> Uh, so they're a type of corporation that use the power of business to make social and environmental changes. Um, so it's really like a standard. You, if you apply and you, you are accepted as a B Corp, so Ben & Jerry's is a B Corp company. Okay. Um, Patagonia is a B Corp certified what company. What type of company you funded? Um, we build bicycles. Bicycles? Yeah, bicycles. I build bicycles out of bamboo. There you go. Yeah. Right. And so you, you can apply for a B and you've been accepted because if what, what part of it? Because the materials you use well, or because people are not going to be putting any CO2 by using cars? You need to fit certain criteria to be B Corp certified, which would be solving uh, social and environmental problems. So there's like a test that you take and you need to get a certain score on the test to be uh, certified. So that's great. Now which we are all aware. What was your question? <laughs> um, a couple days ago. So B Corp exists um, in some states, but not in all. And a couple of days ago, there was just legislation passed saying that Delaware now supports B Corps. And since Delaware is one of the major states where companies in the US are, are founded, I think that that could have some significant impact on companies now trying to make social and environmental changes, the big ones that are already established in Delaware. Right. So I wanted to know your opinion on the impact that that could have. Right. Well, just again to add, right, if you're just in a regular corporation, and Delaware, as you said, is the model that people just tend to use, it's in the statute that you're obligated, right, to maximize the shareholder value, your stockholder's value. That's an obligation you have in leading the company. So the pressure has come for firms that want to undertake programs that advance right, social programs and social good. You're actually at risk at being sued by your shareholders for not upholding the statute. So a B corporation allows you legally to pursue those gains in doing it. That's one aspect. The second is, I think, because when I asked you the question, why? Because it promotes a good image, right? It's positive and helps. I think more people, and again, you're used to it, but more people now want to be involved, want to know that the products and services that they're buying are doing something positive in the world because they know that they can. If you had asked my parents, let's just go back to coffee or even with bicycles, right? If you'd asked my parents about uh, the social benefits of a bicycle, they would have said, hey, I just buy the bike, <laughs> right? That's, and that's as far as it goes and they wouldn't have thought about it. And in, and in my generation, it would have been more like, well, all right, yeah, there is that impact, but it's really hard, or how are you going to do it? I mean, the people only pay for those questions. I think for you guys, it should be automatic. Of course you should want to. And companies are springing up all the time that want to sell you things that reflect what you want, a good social content in the product. And so the B Corp just allows that actually to be done. So it's a great idea, but I think it's actually in the consumer's who are interested in buying things that reflect what they want, greater sustainability, less exploitation, less problems in the world, solving poverty, because people want it, 
then companies can, in essence, sell that to them and sell products that reflect what they want. And so the B Corp just allows them to do it. So they're a great instrument to facilitate what is kind of a societal transitional change in the way that people are looking at themselves and consumers and the power of purchasing. I, I, <clears throat> I don't know about B Corps, but I do often see the impact of social entrepreneurship in Africa. We do uh, an award every year to uh, an NGO in Africa uh, that uh, is that we, that we select, the competition has sort of got kind of quite intense, hundreds of people now apply uh, for the, uh, the, the NGO that's doing most uh, to do advocacy and campaigning on one of the Millennium Development Goals. And what we're finding increasingly is that the finalists that we choose are often NGOs who are, who are not just kind of straight lobbying and not just straight campaigning, but who are doing things through social entrepreneurship particularly in the food and agriculture field, actually. Kind of small scale, uh, small scale uh, organizations that are using local products in innovative ways, that are encouraging farmers to, uh, to grow either new crops or to use uh, old crops uh, in new ways. And we're seeing, I, I've seen this every year now for the last uh, three times that we've looked at this, uh, we've seen more and more of the people who kind of come to us competing for the prize in Africa are social entrepreneurs, it's a, and particularly in the food and agriculture field. It's a very, uh, very kind of striking development that we've noticed. Uh, Mohamed Yunus, uh, last week, the Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Prize winner, he received uh, uh, the gold medal. Yeah. Um, a beautiful ceremony in the hill. Um, and he's been as you know, and if you don't know, I tell you, the creator of the microcredits, um, a lot of uh, supporters of microcredits, some critics of microcredits, but one of the everlasting legacies, I believe, of Mohammed Yunus will be his, what he called his social business, yeah. where he's been very successfully partnered with sometimes big corporations, sometimes small, in creating businesses that they have, they had a social component. If in Bangladesh, children needed calcium and they were lacking calcium, he partnered with Danone, Danone, the big yogurt company, to create yogurts with high quantity in calcium and creating a net of women that will go home by home in every village selling those yogurts. So, creating a business that will hire people in the factory, hiring women that will have a job selling yogurts, and in the process, making everyone successful and making money, and in the process, solving the true problem. Yeah. That was the lack of calcium in the diets of the children in Bangladesh. So social business, uh, obviously, we need companies that make money. And the, and the, the world relies on it. The world economy relies on companies, small or big, that make money. But the truth is that it's very hard when we have so many hundreds of millions of people that are hunger, that are hungry, not to be thinking like until we don't eradicate hunger once and for all, that we will need social business of this type to take care of those issues, always in a sustainable way. So we are really investing into real solutions, not keep throwing money at the problems. So it's great you've done it in Rhode Island and your bike business will be successful. <laughs> you think how you can be bringing this bike business to Haiti, or maybe in parts of America that really they need jobs and uh, they need somebody to keep moving the economy forward. So keep doing it. Thank you. Good job. Question, one more question. Right, let's find one round. I'm gonna apologize, but I'm gonna go back to seeds. Based on the conversation and the discussion we've had to make it more helpful, I'm gonna perhaps uh, paraphrase the first young lady's question that I don't think got, answer, the, got answered, which I still don't know what a good seed is. Is it something that includes or excludes GMOs? It, does it include or exclude patents? Like what, what makes them good seeds? Uh, people have been developing uh, better seeds uh, without GMO for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, our, our attitude to all technological uh, advancement in food production is that it's up to the country themselves to determine what sort of what sort of technology they want uh, that they should that they should take the lead on it. But there's there's an enormous uh, scale 
and, uh, and set of, of improvements in inputs that you can make uh, in, in agriculture just by getting better varieties of seeds, by kind of taking um, uh, the, uh, the work that's been done uh, in, uh, in terms of, of improving uh, outputs without necessarily going to GMO. Uh, thank you guys again for coming. Uh, one of the themes that we discussed today is this, the controversial US policy shift from exporting, um, I guess, right. food-based aid to exporting monetary-based aid. And on one hand, it kind of speaks to this give versus teach a man to fish mentality. But on another, it creates the issue of who manages the investment. So can you tell sure. us a little bit more about how that investment's managed and how we ensure that it um, provides access to everyone in the community instead of just an elite few? No, absolutely. The third, the third element that we put up uh, in, in my presentation there on our, model of, uh, on our model of advocacy stressed accountability and where that is, that is absolutely a crucial part of what we do. I mean, we, we, we have three prongs to the work that we do. We have an inside game, which is very, very high level lobbying by professional staff and by people like Bono and others on Capitol Hill, in the administration, in Brussels, in Berlin, what have you. We have an outside game. Uh, which is the support that three million members around the world give to what we do. But thirdly, and absolutely crucial, uh, it's to hold ourselves account accountable for what it is that we do and to encourage accountability of all those uh, who are stewards, if you like, uh, of taxpayers' generous contributions uh, to make life better. So, so th there is no question in my mind, that it is absolutely essential for anyone who is, uh, who is leading an organization like the one that I do uh, to say that it is, it is, it is just a, a, a bedrock principle uh, that we have to do everything we can to make sure that money is spent in an accountable way, that money is spent effectively, uh, that money is spent so that it benefits everyone that we have. Uh, I, I really do believe that there has been a revolution uh, an ongoing revolution uh, in the last 10 or 15 years uh, in the way that money is spent. Uh, new technology is helping enormously. Uh, just simple things like the mobile phone, which is kind of spread like wildfire all over the developing world, and particularly in Africa, as you know, provides us with way, way better tools than we have ever had before to make sure that money and other assistance gets to the people who need it most. And there are some fabulous programs uh, springing up all over Africa and all over the developed world, but I would say particularly in Africa, to make sure uh, that money is spent uh, in the right way. So it's a great question. It's a really important issue. Uh, it's one that organizations like mine uh, and all NGOs that kind of really care about this thing too, as I, I believe, uh, take seriously and absolutely should take seriously. Because, you know, I can kind of say until the cows can come home, uh, that, uh, that the American Overseas Development Budget is, you know, 0.3% of, uh, of the federal budget. It's tiny in the grand scheme of things, but it's a generous amount of money. It's a generous amount of money, and American taxpayers have the right to expect that that money is spent effectively uh, and spent uh, in the way that kind of really makes a, 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 a big difference in tackling issues of, uh, of poverty, global health, hunger, malnutrition, what have you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Michael. Big round of applause. So, people of yours, Washington, today is our last class. Uh, I think over the last three, four weeks, we've been able to see all different issues that are in direct relationship with food. Food is not anymore only the plate that we have in front of us, but actually the plate that we have in front of us or the lack of food on that plate that we have in front of us connects with the entire world in ways that we can not even imagine. I know that many of the issues are brought. I know many of the issues one hour and a half every week, even having some of the best speakers we can be bringing for them to be sharing uh, their expertise with us and some of the amazing work all the professors of US Washington, they've done trying to bring the different issues. We will never have enough time, even in an entire semester, even if we will pick one of those classes. Uh, food aid, international crisis, 
You can be entire semester on its own. But remember that the intention of this class, the intention of this class was only to scratch the surface, to open a window for every one of you. That's a matter what you will become, I told you before. Lawyers, doctors, lobbyists. I hope you'll be loving for the right side. <laughs> Whatever you become, to always remember, especially if you become a politician, that always whatever you do, try to connect the dots because everything is interconnected. And if we are able to connect the dots in ways no one is able to see, every decision we make, hopefully always will be a better decision because we will make sure that by achieving jobs, we don't leave people hungry in Africa. That by being able to uh, increase our GDP, we don't make uh, Earth that has more CO2 output. By every single decision we will make, by making sure that you and I, we have good fancy food in our table, we don't have a coffee grower somewhere around the world just barely making it every day to feed their family. And at the end, hopefully, having a very big, broad vision of what it means to feed people we will really start changing one plate at a time. That's what this class was supposed to be achieving. So thank you very much for being such a good student, such a good players. I've been enjoying very much in my last week abroad in Spain watching many of the videos you've all made. They've made these amazing videos where they tackle a food oh, issue. Yeah, yeah. And they came with sometimes the solution, sometimes maybe even a bigger problem than the problem we had before. <laughs> But nonetheless, amazing videos that really right. everyone chose a different area, whatever they wanted, from snaps, food stamps, to the life of a chicken, very interesting one, um, <laughs> and many others. So I thank you for your commitment. I want to thank uh, the entire uni university, especially the president, Steve Knapp, but even more than Mr. Knapp, his wife, Diane, that is very much one of the reasons we are all here, and all the professors. So. People of US Washington, go and feed the world. Yeah. We do really need you to do it. So thank you very much.